Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks, and welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host and meteorologist, D.T. from Weather Risk, the captain of chaos, the colonel of confusion, the commander of catastrophe. Let's talk about This Week in Weather, and we have a lot to talk about on this November 2020, so let's get right to it. First, as always, here's the website. And again, uh, there at the bottom, you can get the uh, three-week newsletter, only $5 a month, gives you the forecast. comes out every Sunday for the next three weeks uh, for the eastern half of the country, really. Uh, discusses the weather patterns, the trends, uh, and it gives you pretty good weather information in quite a lot of detail the first two weeks and then the general forecast in week three. So it's a useful product, a very popular. Uh, a lot of people use it for a lot of different reasons. So, And like I said, it gives you very good value for your money for only $5 a month. Now, we wanted to take a look at the La Nina first and see what's going on with that. Now, this is the La Nina from November 3rd last week. Notice the dark blue area there in the upper right corner. Let me see if I can blow this up. You can see a little bit there. Um, you can see that the uh, dark blue area, that's minus 4, minus 5 degrees centigrade. That's a large pool of very cold water. And during this time in here in the first week of November, the La Nina was really intensifying and becoming much stronger. And it was approaching moderate levels at the surface. You look at the criteria, it was getting around minus 1.0 centigrade. But the new data, if we can call that up and bring this down a little bit here, the new data here as of November 10th, 9th, it's much weaker. The pool of cold water has almost, the really intense pool has completely dissipated. So look, I mean, look at the difference between this and this. That's quite a bit of a change. Now, I don't know if this is just bad data or what have you, so we don't want to make too much of it. But this, if this is correct, and if the new data a couple days comes out and it doesn't show any change, it would mean that the La Nina might have reached its peak intensity. So that would be interesting. Now, that matches a lot of the climate model forecasts, which show La Nina reaching its peak intensity in late November, early December. So we'll see if that trend actually holds. Let's take a look at the service map here. And this here is our service map as of November 10th. There's our big storm coming out of the Rockies, intensifying over the Dakotas. And there's the cold front right running right from uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, Nebraska, right through central Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. And there are several areas of low pressure, warm front to the south, and then the big low over South Dakota. Now that's going to become the big system. That's going to become a blizzard here or close to blizzard conditions for southern or southeast 25% uh, of Saskatchewan and much of southern Manitoba uh, and the Dakotas as well. Even some rain going over to snow in portions of Nebraska, Minnesota, and Iowa. Now there's the latest radar. You can see this afternoon, early this evening, you can see the thunderstorms associated with the front. And then, uh, now, the reason why I'm bringing that up is because this leads to another problem here. Now, um, this system we know is going to, you know, um, uh, develop that big low. It's going to bring the snow, and then the front's going to kick to the east. We're going to see another mild day in the east of the Mississippi tomorrow. And then as the front races eastward, the rains come in from west to east across the Ohio Valley, the southeastern states on Thursday night, and then Friday morning on the east coast, and then behind it, it gets cold. So... That's the forecast. Everybody knows that. That's not really what the issue is. Now, several days ago, uh, my last update uh, on the uh, Twitter page and on the uh, Facebook page, I posted this. Now, this was from November 6th, so November 7th. This is last week. And I made this post that it looked like the extended models were showing a, a, a much colder pattern developing here after the middle of November with a powerful ridge on the west coast extending up into the Arctic region. So take a look at the pattern there in Alaska. You see the ridge extending up there, the dark red there, right here? And then you can see the flow coming in from Siberia, a nice big broad trough. Now there's no blocking in Greenland, but this is definitely a cold pattern. And it's substantially colder because not only are you getting cold air in Canada, but you have a lot of lines. You see the black area highlighted here? That's flow coming in from the North Pole and Siberia. So that's a pretty cold looking map. And then this is the extended looking map. Now, again, the NAO here in Greenland is positive and the Arctic Oscillation is neutral. But you have a very strong ridge here uh, along the west coast of North America into Alaska. And then you can see the black lines here. This is cross-polar flow. You hear this term used all the time by forecasters, meteorologists on YouTube and uh, Weather Channel and AccuWeather and Weather Nation, all these other sources. And it's very important. Cross-polar flow is how you get your biggest, coldest air masses. So that brings in the cold air from Siberia across the North Pole into Canada. 
and then it eventually gets into the United States. So that's what that looks like. This is a pretty cold looking map for November 21. And this would be the coldest, you know, middle portion of November we've had in the central and eastern U.S. in several years, if this is correct. The problem is it's not correct. And even though I was impressed by it and excited by it, well, you have to face reality here. And this is not going to happen. Not like this. So let me make that very clear. This is wrong. It's not going to happen like this in the last 10 days of November. The problem is the Maddie and Julian oscillation. Now, here we go. This is what the Australians are showing. And you can see this is yesterday's run. And if you look at the line here, you can see the initial right there in the middle of the map where the arrow is. You can see my arrow. And then it goes up into phase six and then phase seven then loops around briefly in the phase eight, but then it, by the time it gets into phase eight, it's back in the neutral circle again, November 19th, and then it loops back into phase six or seven. So what we're looking at here is for, if for the next two or three weeks, according to this MJO projection, and the other models are turning towards this, the European model turning towards this, so is the Canadian, the Japanese, the GFS, so all towards it, turning towards this solution. The Australian MJO model, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, is the best one in the world, it's the most accurate, and uh, and also part because the MJO also has the most reliable um, MJO data, them, them, that and all well, the Japanese does do as well. But and the reason why this is important, phase six and phase seven, because here in phase six, during La Nina, in the month of November, you get this kind of jet stream pattern. Now, this is not a cold pattern. You have a monster trough in the eastern Pacific. Keep that in mind because we're going to see more of that. We've already seen that for much of November, bringing these huge storms into the northeast Pacific, monster, you know, these 940, 935 millibar uh, monster ocean lows that have been slamming into British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest and bringing in the heavy rains on the coast, the huge mountain snows that they need in the drought areas very, very badly. But we have this big, gigantic ridge um, over the central portions of the plains in the Midwest. Then you have a bit of a trough in, over New England, bringing down some cold air into New England and the Mid-Atlantic region. Then you have another big ridge in the central Pacific, which some people mistake for a negative NAO. It's not a Greenland block. It's not a negative NAO. It is simply known as the North Atlantic Thumb Ridge. The North Atlantic Thumb Ridge. That's the R there south of Iceland. That is not a negative NAO. That is a thumb ridge. Not the same thing. This is phase seven. If the MJO goes into phase seven in November, look what happens here. You have an above normal heights across Canada, the central and eastern U.S. There's no real cold air flow anywhere in the in the North America. The jet stream is pushed to the north. It's not a great pattern. This is a shitty pattern for cold weather and for snow in uh, phase seven in, in November. It's just not a good looking map. Now, if we look at our teleconnections, we also see nothing like what we, the models were showing here a couple uh, several days ago. Look at here. We're supposed to see the EPO is supposed to be negative on this map, according to on the European from November 6th and 7th. The PNA is supposed to be very positive. The NAO is supposed to be positive, and the AO, the Arctic Oscillation, is supposed to be neutral. Well, if we go to here, look at our teleconnections. Here, the Arctic Oscillation stays neutral all the way through, so that's okay. And then if we go to the NAO, here it goes briefly negative around November 13th, and then it goes back to being positive around November 15th to 20th, and finally neutral as we go towards the end of the month. Uh, the PNA, this is the EPO, the Eastern Pacific Oscillation, it's positive right now. You can see the black dots there. Then it goes neutral almost all the way through until the end of the month. That, that's not what's supposed to happen. It's supposed to be strongly negative. So this means no cross-polar flow at all. And this here is the PNA, which remember we had that huge ridge on the West Coast, according to those models from last week. We're not seeing that now. The PNA actually goes slightly negative around, around November 15th to 17th. Then it goes slightly positive or, or back towards neutral. That's not what we're supposed to see. So if all these teleconnections are not supporting this, we can't go with that forecast. We have to change our perspective, our outlook for the second half of November going into December. We have to. The data says we have to do that. Wishing is not a forecast. Wishing is not science. Let's take a look at the actual models and data and see what's going on here. All right. So this here is our upper air map 
on this uh, Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening. There's a monster trough pushing in from the Pacific. And remember that upper low we talked about in Alaska, the Gulf of Alaska right here? Look at this in the upper left corner. And again, go back to look at that. There it is. The T, the red T means trough, and the black R's mean ridges. So you can see the monster trough there. It's exactly what we're seeing right now in phase six. There it is. And there's a trough coming into the uh, across the Rockies down towards Texas is negatively tilted so the surface low pressure that develops is going to explode and intensify and then move up towards Minnesota where it will get trapped by this block in northern Canada see the block there that's still there that's exactly what happens there it is the blocking feature in central Canada um, which has been there for a while that's a that's a constant feature it forces the trough to close off and develop a monster up below embedded within the trough, the upper lows over Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the Western Great Lakes. This is now on November 12th going into November 13th. Now the trough eventually it pushes to the East Coast. There's a second piece of energy which comes in this Saturday which reinforces the cold front. Maybe bring some snow showers to the Great Lakes, the mountains of Pennsylvania, New York State, New England, but that's about it. There's the trough. It's very strong on November, on November 14, 15 on the East Coast. And that's our cold weather. We get a big blast of cold weather. It lasts for a couple of days, but that's all it does. Look at the ridge on the West Coast here on this slide. Again, that's not an amplified ridge. It's an ordinary ridge. It doesn't go up towards British Columbia. It doesn't extend up to, up to Northwest Canada or Alaska. Very ordinary looking ridge. Now beyond that, here we go. This is the GFS, operational GFS, at 174 hours out, November 17th. There's the polar vortex. You see at the top of the map, see the red line that I drew there? The polar vortex, this is what I call the football shaped polar vortex. Imagine the shape of a football and you have your two points at the end of the football. That's what we're looking at here. This is the kiss of death if you want cold weather in the United States or the central and eastern United States. The kiss of death, if this is right because the, all the cold air is trapped around the polar vortex and it's staying way to the north of the U.S.-Canada border. In this pattern, there is no mechanism at all to get the cold air into the United States, the central and eastern U.S., or even the west coast for that matter. And look at the thick black lines. That is the mean flow here coming in straight from the Pacific. This is Pacific air mass, no cold air, no Canadian air, no Arctic air. Um, and this is, you know, if you want cold weather, um, for the middle of November, this is a disaster. This is nothing like what the models were showing only last week. This is November 17th, and if we go back and take a look at the model data, show you what it looked like, that's not that. I'm sorry, that's not even close. Look at the difference between that and that. Again, now you can say, well, that just proves all models are full of shit. They don't know what they're doing. Well, things change, you know. What can I tell you, folks? Put on your big boy pants and stop whining. The shit, you know, stuff happens, okay? And this is what the polar vortex is showing on the GFS. Now, that may not be correct, but again, what the point here also, the other point I'm trying to teach you here is when the polar vortex is shaped in that west to east orientation, it's terrible if you want cold air in the central and eastern U.S., not going to happen. I don't give a hoot in hell what else is going on. That is a kiss of death when it's shaped like that. Now, here's the GFS Ensemble, which is a little different. Now, this is different from this. So as bad as this is, it may not be accurate. So there you go. Now, this here is the GFS Ensemble. And the GFS Ensemble shows the, the polar vortex much stronger and it's pointed you can see the red line there in a northwest to southeast orientation so here the cold air is getting into the united states now it's not getting in directly to the east and third but at least it's not trapped up in canada okay so now we have our next front system coming through november 17th 18th we have a ridge over the eastern united states so it warms up for a couple of days and then the next cold front comes through another big system for the rockies for the upper plains for the canadian prairies more cold and more snow for those guys but at least we're not getting cold air is not trapped up in canada so that's a little better now the gfs ensemble however does it again by november 20th again here's the polar vortex you can see a highlighted PV polar vortex and look at the red arrows. It is 
shaped in that west to east orientation which means the cold air is trapped around the height lines and it has no mechanism for getting into the united states the mean flow is coming straight in from the pacific you see that straight in on the black line a big thick black arrow straight in on the pacific no method mechanism to get the cold air into the eastern united states not through De not through november 20th which is the beginning of thanksgiving week now the other problem with the pattern is look at the upper low here in the gulf of alaska or Aleutian islands that that's again that's when you have that low there and the polar vortex shape like that you can't get a ridge on the west coast of north america can't happen it's simple wave physics can't happen so that's another reason why it's a problem now the european is a little different 306 hours this is november 23rd notice it has more ridging here Oh, over the west coast of north america not a huge ridge but definitely some ridging and the trough is in the midwest along the mississippi valley the ohio valley this is a little colder this is more like typical november cold that's what this is showing so that's not too bad it's not anything to write home to mom about but it that's a, this is a seasonally cold thanksgiving is what this is if this is right east of the mississippi river and it provides a break in the storminess for the west coast and the rockies and they could use the break quite frankly some of the mountains are getting a lot of snow they could use the break so that's not bad but um and then of course there's the gfs at 324 hours out again show you a huge difference this is 306 and this is the next day and again the pole of the gfs is totally different has that polar vortex the ensemble in that west east orientation no mechanism for the cold air to get into the united states power overpowering pacific jet stream sweeping across the country these two maps are not the same there is no compromise here you can't say well i'll split the difference it doesn't work that way these are diametrically opposed solutions i don't know which one's correct but um you know keeping given the fact that the mgo's in phase six or seven which is not great for cold air the gfs might be and then here's the european for um uh, for November 25, here's Thanksgiving. Now, the upper low, notice the upper low, instead of being Aleutian Islands in Alaska, look where it is, over in the Alaskan Panhandle. That's not as bad. And that allows some ridging on the west coast of North America, and you're getting a moderate trough over the Midwest into New England. There's no big ridge over the southeastern states, and you have a polar vortex in its normal climatological position in northern Canada by Baffin Island. So this is not a horrible looking map if you want seasonal cold air it doesn't look particularly stormy um but um at least it's not a blowtorch which is what some of the gfs was indicating all right so that's the presentation hopefully you've learned something about this i'm sorry i had to change the forecast but my job is to get the forecast right not to blow smoke up my own asshole so i, I you know the initial prediction the initial assessment i saw for the second half of november that's wrong it's not going to happen. Not that sort of severe cold. Not just not. Not in this pattern. Not with the MJO phase six and phase seven. Now, hopefully, La Nina continues to weaken and it doesn't come roaring back. Um, so we'll see how that plays in it. But for the time being, the most we can hope for is some sustained cold in the last week of November. This is meteorologist DT from Weather Risk. I will see you over on the Twitter page and on the website and on the Facebook page.